Um, so first of all, just to welcome you all again to both our presenter today, all the participants and the students and our colleagues in Potsdam to what is the sixth lecture of our series on migration and displacement histories, stories and myths, which is part of our explorations together in Potsdam supported by the DAAD to set up or to think about how migration studies fits into our curricula. I think one of the interesting things that we're finding is that perhaps it might be better to think rather than setting up a migration studies program, which is separate, but how it actually filters in through the courses that are already there and how we enhance those, which will be an interesting conversation to have. Um, and I'm not doing this alone, of course, but with all my colleagues, but in particular with my hosts, Filippo Carola Uhink, who's professor in ancient history and professor of global history, Marcia Schenk, um, and uh, this has really very much already been an incredibly fruitful experience. We are also co-hosted by the Roots Migration, Mobility and Displacement Network at the University of Exeter. So just very briefly about the format, uh, Professor Berend will speak for about 45 minutes or so, and this will be followed by about a 30 minute discussion. And of course, students are always encouraged to speak, um, or just unmute yourself, put on your videos or, or anybody else. Um, but also if you prefer, please put your questions in the chat. Um, so without uh, further ado, I would just like to introduce Professor Berend, who's going to talk to us about tales of migration in medieval Hungary. And uh, Nora Berend is a professor of European history at the University of Cambridge, and the focus of her research is on medieval history and the uses of that medieval themes and modern nationalism. She has worked on the place of non-Christians in medieval Christian society, including economic, social, legal, and religious interaction, medieval frontiers, sanctity, and also violence. And her current work focuses on the formation of identity in medieval and modern times. She's also a critical thinker on migration and mobility, and in the way it intercepts with these other historical themes in the period. And some of her publications include At the Gate of Christendom, Jews, Muslims, and Pagans in Medieval Hungary from 1000 to 1300, and this was awarded the Gladstone Prize for Non-British History by the Royal Historical Society. And she's also co-edited with David Abulafia, Medieval Frontiers, Concepts and Practices, and the expansion of Central Europe in the Middle Ages, which came about 10 years later. So Nora, thank you very much for taking your time out to be with us today and to tell us the tales of migration in medieval Hungary. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. Um, if I disappear of the screen partially, that's because I have another screen here with a text. Uh, I'm trying to save the environment and not print everything. So um, um, just bear with me. So first, oops, now, okay. The, this worked perfectly when we tried it, but now my PowerPoint doesn't want to move. Anyone has any ideas of why that is? You might if um, maybe you try to go in and out of it again because maybe it opened up on a different screen and you've got another screen up in front of it. You just I don't out. know. I actually, I mean, I will try that, but I oh, okay. now it works. You did that one. Okay, sorry. I for some reason the arrows don't work, but when I click <laughs> on it, it works. All right. So, um, I want to start a little bit by uh, talking about the current uh, political uses of some of those tales that I will be talking about. Because there's a very interesting paradox going on in Hungary at the moment. Uh, I mean, when I say interesting, I don't mean to justify it or anything. Um, so on the one hand, um, the Hungarian government, the right-wing government is very much pushing the sort of narrative of migrants who are endangering society Hungary as the bulwark of Christendom, uh, that supposedly the country um, has been fulfilling this role for centuries. So um, uh, this very noxious interwar ideology, so the Hungarian government in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, very much operated with similar um, ideas about Hungary as bulwark of Christendom, um, is added to uh, the what we, are familiar with from other countries as well, this kind of right-wing uh, interpretation of the refugee crisis. Um, now, the Hungarian government has been at the forefront of these really toxic discourses, uh, accusing George Soros of 
uh, orchestrating some sort of migrate mass migration to replace the Christians uh, by Muslims to destroy European civilization. Um, so there is a, a, a kind of um, relentless campaign uh, with posters, with speeches. Uh, the prime minister, Viktor Orban, um, declared uh, many, many times that uh, Hungary is the last migrant free zone. He compared uh, the Hungarians uh, defense uh, of Christendom to uh, the uprising of 1956 and Hungarians as freedom fighters. Um, so um, on the one hand, you, you kind of have massive amounts of this kind of discourse, but on the other hand, there is a revival uh, of another aspect of interwar political ideology, which is that the Hungarians came from Asia, that they are a Turkic uh, people speaking a Turkic language. So the, the kind of westernmost uh, Turks, um, that they descend from Attila the Hun. And uh, this gives them a kind of political role in the present. Uh, this is called um, Turanism, it's a particular branch of Turanism, the political branch, which claims that because of this supposed descent, Hungarians have a leading role in the region. So in the interwar period, Hungarian politicians tried to claim some sort of a leadership role for Hungary uh, when it came to the various Turkic speaking peoples and the Hungarian prime minister is trying to do something similar today. Um, it's completely illusionary and lunatic, um, uh, but it is based on this idea that the Hungarians came from Asia. So it makes migration, this very long distance migration of the Hungarians, central to Hungarian identity. So there is this paradox. On the one hand, this alleged historical migration is positive, of course, and central to Hungarian identity. On the other hand, actual migration happening today is demonized as something to be afraid of and to avoid and to defend against. Um, now, the, the tales that I will be talking about that were developed in the medieval period gave rise to modern scholarship reconstructing, but actually not re, but just constructing, the supposed root of this migration of the Hungarians. And some uh, aspects of uh, linguistics, uh, which actually show that the Hungarians are not Turkic, but uh, it's a Finno-Ugric language. Uh, uh, so these um, linguistic considerations have been coupled to ethnography, various alleged similarities of folk customs. Uh, and of course, I, I really need to emphasize this is hugely tenuous because we're talking about 19th century collections of ethnography claiming that whatever they could detect in the 19th century is actually kind of an ageless, uh, you know, many thousand year old um, folk custom. Uh, and sort of piecing together these various in themselves extremely tenuous pieces, uh, uh, this um, uh, root of, of the migration um, has been you know, claimed to be to, to, to have been the historical migration of the Hungarians. And of course, the major piece of evidence is actually medieval chronicle texts, and I'm going to be talking about those. So. Uh, you can see here um, uh, sort of one uh, reconstruction or reconstruction that gets into similar things, get into school books and so on. And here's another one with, um, uh, you know, these kind of romanticizing 19th century images of the Hungarians as well. Um, so the these medieval tales are, are not at all kind of in the past. Uh, they have a very strong impact in the present um, and they're used for uh, presentist purposes. But let's kind of jump now 
back to the Middle Ages um, to see how and why these tales of migration were actually created. And the first thing I should say is that medieval Hungary, um, ironically, given the current government's hostility to migrants, um, has been called uh, by historians a guest land because there were so many different migrant populations. The, the population was very mixed from the very beginning. So at the time of the arrival of these Hungarians who themselves actually were a mixed population. So it's, it's certain that speakers of different languages were part of this sociomilitary association. We call them the Hungarians, but it's somewhat misleading because it gives the sense of some sort of ethnic purity, which certainly did not exist. So they themselves were mixed, but they also found local populations so the Avars and Slavs who lived there already and who certainly uh, merged into these sort of new arrivals and, and the Hungarians as we know them from the medieval period were actually this kind of mixed population. So already there is, is that kind of mixing, but also there were various immigrants and Every century, so from the 10th century on, we know that, that there were different groups immigrating. And this continued into the late medieval period. It actually continued beyond the medieval period, but I won't talk about it. Um, so uh, in one 14th century chronicle, there is a list uh, of, of these immigrants and uh, they name Jews, Muslims, uh, Pechenegs and Kumans. They're, these two are Turkic nomadic people from the Black Sea area, Armenians, Rus, and various German and Romance speakers. So um, there's also other kind of evidence of the settlement of various groups. Some of them got uh, legal privileges, so uh, settled in, in groups. Uh, others just merged into the local population very quickly. And not only was Hungary, medieval Hungary, uh, this guest land, this land of immigrants, but there were many uh, identities that were based on tales of migration. Not only the tales of the Hungarians as a people, but also tales of migration of various individuals, families, um, and, and other groups. Now, in the medieval period, there were actually possible advantages to being an immigrant. So very much unlike today, uh, it was seen as even uh, more prestigious. This had a number of reasons. This was not specifically Hungarian. This was true of many medieval uh, polities. First of all, rulers were always keen to attract people who had particular skills or knowledge. So very often privileges were offered to these people to attract them to come and settle. Uh, this could be, for example, miners. Uh, it could be uh, town dwellers to um, facilitate uh, the, the, the growth of towns. It could be farmers to till the land. So it could be all sorts of status groups who um, received a better uh, legal status, so privileges. So for example, they had to pay less tax uh, or they had certain freedoms guaranteed to them by virtue of being immigrants. And underlying that, uh, there was a, a, a broader medieval context that actually valorized migration um, because in the medieval conception, the whole life itself was a kind of journey. And of course the purpose uh, was to spend this journey well so that one's soul would go to heaven and not hell. Uh, there is a, a late medieval play called the Everyman Play, which very much summarizes this worldview. Um, so it's a story of uh, every man, so a, a, a mankind uh, impersonated in one person, uh, who is called to render an account uh, because he will die. And so he, he has this uh, sort of terrible uh, spiritual journey of, of trying to find enough good in his life so that he would not be condemned to hell. Um, related to this, pilgrimage became very central in the medieval period. So 
the idea that by physically walking to a saint's shrine, so um, to the physical, where the physical remains of someone who was seen as a saint, uh, therefore being in heaven with God, um, to, to pray there, to ask for healing, et cetera, et cetera, was seen as meritorious. Um, and of course, all this kind of valorization of movement, of mobility, was very much linked to actual uh, movement, the mobility of ecclesiastics, who were the intellectual elites. So most of our sources actually come from, were written by ecclesiastics. And they themselves uh, went abroad to study, very often traveled around, uh, it, they did not, I mean, some of them immigrated, so they actually moved to another country and stayed there. Others didn't immigrate, but they moved around a lot. So there was a kind of, uh, if you like, personal reason as well for uh, valorizing uh, mobility and migration. And in the, in the medieval period, the whole sort of basic framework for, for the existence of civilization uh, was seen as tied to migration. So the idea was that uh, this east to west migration was fundamental. And you actually have a lot of these stories um, of, of other uh, groups as well, and not just the Hungarians, um, who base their identity on some sort of long distance migration that supposedly happened uh, in the past, which brings us to these origin stories, because the tale of the migration of the Hungarians is, is, of course, one of these origin stories, trying to account for how the Hungarians were formed and came to live where they are when these medieval authors are writing. So this kind of construction of prehistories was pretty standard in the medieval period. Uh, finding an original homeland for these people. So the idea that you already have a people as a defined sort of unit, they were somewhere, <laughs> they came out of that somewhere because of war or some other reason. They moved over even very, very long distances and settled in their current sort of final home. Um, and in the process of these migrations, these groups supposedly uh, became civilized, uh, became Christian, uh, became organized politically. Um, so, of course, um, these stories never actually reflect realities, but the mental map of the ecclesiastics who wrote them. One of these very um, influential uh, and famous origin stories was the Trojan origin story of the Franks. So, uh, of course, the, the Trojan War uh, sort of a, the, the, the account of that and various medieval reworkings of that uh, were well known uh, in uh, for, for medieval uh, audiences. Um, and they were looking for prestigious ancestors. Um, so the leaders of the Trojans who escaped from Troy uh, were such desirable ancestors. And then other uh, groups tried to find equally prestigious uh, ancestors. So the Hungarian story is very similar to these other uh, medieval stories, and like them, is very much framed by the biblical story of the migration of the Israelites. So um, we even have uh, very explicit references to the Hungarians being, in a sense, the Israelites, and also uh, in the story itself, allusions, references to the biblical um, story. Um, and the other uh, main influence on the creation of, of this Hungarian story uh, was from patristics, so uh, authors who lived way before the Hungarians ever <laughs> arrived on the scene um, and wrote about other people, especially the Scythians. Um, and those were now adopted to refer to the Hungarians. So you can see already in its origins that we really are not talking about some sort of folk memory of real events. Uh, we are talking about very, very constructed stories constructed on the basis of texts that had absolutely nothing to do with the Hungarians. And this is just a um, sort of 
in the ancient landscape in a sense of, of, of this Scythia, which becomes so important uh, in the Hungarian uh, origin story. So um, basically um, the first uh, important text is the text of this Hungarian anonymous uh, called by the way, because we don't know who he was. Um, he was certainly a cleric and he uh, says about himself in the prologue of his work that he uh, worked in the chancery of the king. So we know he was an ecclesiastic, but he has not been identified uh, by, and we of course have very little information about the actual people who lived at this point. So the Chronicle was written around 1200. And uh, the anonymous, uh, combines all kinds of stories um, to give what he calls uh, the true story of the Hungarians' migration. So in the prologue, he says that there are all these um, made up stories uh, and it's not worthy uh, of, of the Hungarians to uh, be told these kind of fake stories. So here, here is the original one. Um, Okay, um, so sorry, I just um, have to look for my quotations. Uh, he says that he is uh, setting down the history of the Hungarians, uh, lest it be lost to posterity forever. Um, and he um, says that basically it is thanks to God that the Hungarians and their kings live now in the country that they occupy. Um, he has to position the Hungarians in the biblical scheme of descent. And of course, this is very important for, for all uh, authors that um, according to medieval ecclesiastics, everything is in the Bible and in patristics. <laughs> Uh, the totality of knowledge. And so if you have a new people, you need to identify them somehow. You need to fit them into the scheme because they cannot be from somewhere else. So they have to descend from one of these biblical uh, ancestors. Um, and so um, basically this is how he uh, cottons on to Scythia and um, uh, Gog and Magog, who are these uh, supposed uh, sort of peoples that are mentioned in various uh, uh, older sources. Now, interestingly, um, he actually says that um, Scythia's neighbors were Gog and Magog, but then he also says that the first king of Scythia was Magog. And this is already uh, a, a real sign of how he was combining different earlier texts. So this was a fairly typical in the Middle Ages that the authors uh, did not know the concept of plagiarism. In fact, they were constantly plagiarizing or what we would call plagiarizing. Um, and so he actually took these uh, things from different texts. Um, the biblical uh, book of Revelation, uh, and the story of Alexander the Great. Um, so you can already see here that it's basically these textual compilations that are driving the, the story. Uh, he also links Magog to Moger, who's supposedly the Hungarian's ancestor. So Hungarian in Hungarian is Magyar. And so uh, obviously these kind of fake etymologies were much beloved by medieval authors. Um, and here, the very slight resemblance is enough for this author to sort of claim uh, this descent. He also gives, uh, so he identifies the Hungarians with the Scythians, but he also gives conflicting views on the Scythians, on the one hand saying that they were these kind of noble barbarians, but on the other hand saying that they drank blood. So here too, you basically have the amalgamation of two textual traditions. Justin's Epitome, so from uh, antiquity, and uh, Regino of Prim from the ninth century. Um, the Anonymous picks up on the idea of the Huns and Hungarians being related. And this actually comes from Western Europe, 
when the Hungarians first appeared, uh, these Western authors and Regino of Prim is, is one of them. So uh, here we have Western ecclesiastics trying to figure out where the Hungarians suddenly came from. Um, and so because they are coming from the East, because they are uh, warriors on horseback, they're amalgamated to the Scythians. The Huns had already earlier been amalgamated to the Scythians. And so if they're both, both um, Scythians, then clearly they're also related to each other. So you have this idea that the Hungarians are somehow the Huns. Um, and in, uh, in, for the anonymous, this relationship, alleged relationship, justifies the land taking of the Hungarians. Um, and even today, uh, the terminology in Hungary is never conquest. It's not Hungarian conquest. It's the taking of the homeland. So it's also, of course, this biblical uh, illusion once again. So just like the Israelites were promised the land, the promised land, um, the Hungarians somehow have this right to this land. So they're not conquering it. They're just kind of taking it for their own. Um, and he talks about the um, uh, ancestors of the Hungarian dynasty. Um, Almus, whose name he uh, mistakenly derives from uh, the word dream. So here too, uh, the, the land taking is foretold because of this dream. Um, and um, his son, Arpad. And he talks about seven chieftains, the seven Hungarians, um, who decide to come out of Scythia uh, because they don't have enough their population grew so much that they don't sort of have enough anymore to, to live on, which is also a kind of literary topos that you find elsewhere. Um, and they come out and they cross this etil. There's been a lot of debate about which river this is. Uh, they cross it on leather bags. Um, and uh, he constructs this um, road uh, from Scythia through this river Etil, Suzdal, Nyeper, College, Galicia, and Transylvania. Um, so for him, uh, there's this very long migration uh, where the um, Hungarians even uh, have uh, fights with the Rus. Uh, they're sort of told to go and take uh, this land, which is so wonderful. So again, you have this contradiction that they set out actually to reclaim the land that was theirs because they're the descendants of Attila the Hun. Uh, but at the same time, they seem to forget that once they get to Rus and they have to be told to kind of go. Um, when they finally uh, arrive at the first place where they uh, settle, uh, the anonymous calls Munkash, Munkach, which is a real uh, uh, place which still exists, but also existed uh, in the 13th century. It's now in Ukraine. Um, and it's, again, a fake etymology in Hungarian. That word resembles the word work. So he basically derives it from with work. They name this place that because they had to take the land with so much work. So you can see this, the whole kind of mental landscape of taking place names that exist in his own time, inventing uh, explanations for them, uh, taking these older texts and sort of you know, weaving together this uh, story. Now, some uh, modern historians suggest that, yes, okay, there are a lot of fanciful and uh, kind of invented uh, uh, episodes in this text, but they're also kind of true, there's also truth value in some of the things and you can identify some episodes that are true. And one of these episodes that allegedly show this is crossing the river on these leather bags. So according to the anonymous, um, they had this kind of bags full of air that they could somehow ride on across the river. Uh, and he gives the name Tulbu, and no one knows what that is. Uh, the hypothesis is that this is some sort of Turkic word. Um, in any case, <laughs> the, the argument has been that he 
that the anonymous has um, sort of seen still such river crossings and it's allegedly kind of proof that this is some kind of ancient Hungarian custom. So there's only a little bit of a problem with this, which is that we have lots of other texts which talk about this kind of river crossing by nomads, not Hungarians, other kinds of nomads. And in fact, it goes back to antiquity. So it's already being claimed in uh, texts from antiquity about barbarians. So clearly, this is also a kind of literary topos. Uh, this is just a map of um, the, the Rus, so what you see here in, in pink, and then uh, Hungary, so it's just um, this uh, part of this alleged route that the anonymous um, wrote about. Now, um, it's, it's very clear that the sources of the ideas of the anonymous were not folk memory of the migrations. We can identify some of these sources, Justin, Paul the Deacon, Isidore of Seville. None of them wrote about the Hungarians and in the early centuries, the Hungarians did not even exist at all. So it's taking up motives that these other authors wrote about the Scythians and by virtue of the identification of the Hungarians as Scythians, which rests on no real, <laughs> you know, no reality. I mean, this is a literary identification then everything that was said about the Scythians can be said about the Hungarians. So we are really talking about literary stereotypes. I, I really need to kind of emphasize that. And of course, when the Western authors had to account for the appearance of the Hungarians in the ninth century, they did exactly this. They kind of took these stereotypes about the Scythians and applied to them to the Hungarians. The Hungarian anonymous is actually borrowing from Western sources doing this. So instead of being real memory of the Hungarian migrations. It's borrowing from Western authors who borrowed from earlier Western authors uh, about, you know, others. Moreover, this coming from Scythia, which is so central in the whole story, and, and now in Hungary, in these political discourses, it's taken to be a kind of unique thing uh, uh, that Hungarians are, are Scythians. But in fact, what happens is the rest of Europe is no longer hung up on the medieval tales that they are Scythians. So in medieval stories, you find Gaelic people, the Turks, Picts, Goths, all of them claiming to be from Scythia. So in fact, we have plenty of medieval people supposedly coming out of Scythia. There's nothing unique about the Hungarians. The unique thing is that some of the Hungarians anyway still kind of want to hang on to this or re revive this. Um, now, we can also see that there are other medieval Hungarian chronicles which pick up the story of this long Hungarian migration, but they're actually conducting polemics against each other. So we have textual polemics between the medieval sources, which again sort of shows you how these are not reflections of real stories, they're just taking other texts and other uh, proof texts. So here's the illuminated chronicle of the middle of the 14th century, uh, talking about uh, Hunor and Magor, who are supposedly these brothers who come out of um, Scythia. Uh, and here, Scythia is initially, so, so they come out of these swamps, of the Neotis swamps, and initially they take Scythia from the Ruthenians. Uh, the, the road of the migration is a little bit different. So uh, go through the lands of the Pechenegs and the White Kumans and then Suzlal and, and Kiev. Um, and then this region of the Eagles. So there's this fairy tale land where they are um, attacked by eagles and they have to escape. And then finally they get to Transylvania. So you can see kind of more and more elaborations of some of the stories. Uh, in this illuminated chronicle, they're also, uh, it's called illuminated because there are these illustrations, which are quite uh, fascinating. Um, I'm sorry, the, um, the actual uh, manuscript is, is damaged, and that's why this image is not great, because you kind of have the erosion of, of the image. But still, you can see this is a, a representation in the 14th century, of course, so this is a 14th century artist imagining 
the, the story of the Hungarians' long migration. So you can see those covered carts on the right-hand side uh, with the uh, soldiers coming, um, and you can sort of see, uh, obviously, Western-style armor. So the representation is the representation of 14th century figures and not kind of uh, ancient uh, Hungarians. Um, and this is another one from uh, that um, series uh, of illustrations. And this actually represents uh, the story uh, that is in the 14th century chronicle that the Hungarians, after they arrive, they trick the local ruler uh, and they say, um, can you give us a handful of earth and a little bit of um, grass and a little water for this white horse. And you know they bring this beautiful white horse with a saddle, golden saddle and everything. And the ruler thinks he's making a fantastic deal with these idiots. And so he says, yeah, sure, you know, take, take it and um, takes the horse. And the Hungarians say, oh, well, you sold us your whole kingdom. So now it's ours. So you can see kind of the addition of, of more and more kind of invented tales. Um, the, the tale gets even more rewritten in the late uh, 15th century by John Turozzi. And he has various interesting debates that he discusses in his uh, chronicle. So, for example, he says, um, some chroniclers claim that Nimrod was the uh, ancestor of the Hungarians and others say Magog was the ancestor of the Hungarians. Um, and, you know, who is it? Um, and he looks at what he calls authorities in order to decide this. And who are the authorities? They are 15th century authors uh, like this. Uh, it's actually Archbishop. Sorry, I wrote Bishop, but Archbishop um, Antoninus, um, uh, Pope uh, Pius II, uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, St. Jerome. So again, you can see, you know, he comes to the decision that it's Magog, son of Japhet, who is a real uh, ancestor of the Hungarians, based on St. Jerome and on these 15th century authors. He also discusses whether Scythia is in Europe or in Asia, and again, sort of decides based on uh, authors like Pliny and so on. So um, geographical authorities uh, of uh, late antiquity. Um, so you have these reworked migrations of uh, the Hungarians themselves, but then there are also tales of migration of noble families and other groups. And um, I want to talk at least a little bit about these uh, as well before I uh, finish. Um, the first text to talk about these migrant nobles is a late 13th century chronicle of Simon of Kesa. And he compiles this list of what is called advene newcomers, but in fact, they're not newcomers, they're people who came centuries previously, um, but settled in the kingdom. But the idea is that he wants to compile this list of those noble families who immigrated uh, and yes. describe who their ancestors, so, so they, he gives the names of people living in his own times and, and their ancestors. It's um, really um, interesting that this list is compiled at a time when it was no longer very easy to integrate for actual newcomers. So those nobles who immigrated in the 13th century already encountered significant issues. Uh, a, a, a queen of Hungary was even murdered uh, because uh, supposedly uh, of, the, of these tensions. And the point of this whole list is that Simon wants to prove that these immigrants um, came a very long time ago. And in a few cases, we can actually detect that um, he's lying. In other words, he's giving a much earlier uh, date of arrival for these families than what we know from the charter evidence. Uh, it's probably not Simon himself. It's probably the families giving him the information who are making it up. So obviously, we don't, this we cannot prove. Um, 
he he doesn't say where he gets the information from, but logically he's getting it from the specific families he's writing about. And just sort of two examples of this, he talks about these brothers, Bolfer and Edricus, who come supposedly from Heinborg, um, who are the ancestors of this uh, specific uh, family called the Heder. And he talks about how they came because um, the father of uh, the first Christian king of Hungary, St. Stephen, who was trying to Christianize Hungary, was calling on Westerners to come and help him do this. So obviously, this is a very prestigious thing to be associated to um, the Christianization of Hungary and sort of entering the country for that uh, purpose. Um, however, we, so that, that would place their immigration um, at the very end of the 10th, early 11th century. However, we actually have charter evidence which shows that these people arrived in the middle of the 12th century. Um, so clearly the family wanted to sort of project into the past um, the arrival of their ancestors. Um, and there's another case, which in a sense is even more interesting um, because um, uh, Simon talks about this uh, person called Hot, uh, who's also called Ernestus, um, and uh, he allegedly immigrated into Hungary at the end of the 10th, early 11th century, so again, similar period as the previous ones, and founded the monastery of Lebin, Lebin. and uh, Simon also names his descendant, this count, Conrad of Altenburg. Now, we know Conrad of Altenburg is attested in the sources uh, uh, between 1239 and 1299. Um, and he uh, got into a huge conflict with the king. So he was accused of uh, misbehavior. So at one point, the family monastery, the Slebin, which the immigrant ancestor supposedly founded, was confiscated and his other lands were confiscated. But finally, after a while, he reconciled with the king and he regained these possessions. This all happened before the writing of Simon's Chronicle. But from logically, what we can reconstruct is that uh, Conrad, after the reconciliation, was very keen to further bolster the family credentials by claiming to have such a kind of early immigrant ancestor. Because again, we actually have charter evidence that there was a pot who was even Palatine, so a very high position um, at the royal court, in the early 13th century, uh, who founded this monastery. Now, there's no way that Conrad would confuse his, his own grandfather or father. I mean, it's impossible to tell uh, exactly because we only know we don't know when these people were born. We only know when they sort of uh, hold office. And that's what appears in the sources. So, you know, at most his grandfather, uh, there's no way he would confuse him with, uh, you know, an ancestor who uh, immigrated centuries before. So it's quite clear, I think, that he is telling a tall tale to um, buttress the, the family credentials. And finally, just very briefly, I want to talk uh, about, uh, in a way, as a kind of conclusion, about actual real uh, mass immigration into Hungary. So um, obviously, we talked about the, the tale of the Hungarians, who as a people supposedly moved. So that's a kind of mass migration, if you like. But then I talked about these individual nobles or at most families. And of course, that's a very different kind of thing if you have one family or one person immigrating. There were also real kind of groups immigrating uh, in the Middle Ages uh, and uh, the, their um, treatment could be quite different from uh, what was in a sense uh, prescribed or um, uh, envisaged um, in the admonitions of St. Stephen. So uh, these admonitions are kind of king's mirror. Uh, they were written in the early 11th century, certainly not by Stephen, uh, but some uh, ecclesiastic. And in it, we find that guests, and I put that uh, quotation uh, there, that guests should be welcomed uh, because they bring all these skills and uh, all, all these um, good things for the, for the kingdom. Uh, a country of one language and one set of customs is weak and vulnerable. I therefore enjoin on you, my son, to protect newcomers benevolently. So 
there is this very often cited text of how these newcomers should be uh, treated. Um, but in the uh, middle of the 13th century, uh, the most important mass immigration uh, happened when the Kumans uh, arrived. The Kumans were a Turkic uh, steppe nomadic people. Uh, the area was being overran by the Mongols. So the Kumans were defeated by the Mongols and some of them, so this is not the whole kind of population, but a large part of, of the Kumans uh, tried to get refuge in Hungary. So they came under their own leader. The Hungarian king was quite keen to let them in because they represented a significant military force. Um, they promised to be baptized um, and uh, the king tried to settle them down. Now, we had this very intriguing text from the middle of the 13th century by Master Rogerius, um, who wrote uh, a text about the Mongol invasion of Hungary. And in it, uh, he described the tensions between uh, the king and the Hungarian nobility, who were very unhappy about uh, the presence of the Kumans. They um, alleged that the king favored the Kumans over the nobles um, and uh, had all kinds of grievances. Uh, Master Rogerius also says that the local population, uh, local settled population, was very unhappy uh, because the Kumans continued to kind of move around and they destroyed their crops, they were violent. Um, but what happened was that um, the Mongols eventually reached Hungary as well. So they invaded Hungary. Um, and as the news of the, the Mongol armies reached, so that the, the news that these Mongol armies breached the borders and were in Hungary, uh, as this news came to the royal court, many of the nobles accused the Kumans of being spies of the Mongols. So they said that these refugees were not refugees, but in fact, a kind of vanguard and uh, wanted to kill uh, the Kuman leader. Um, and there's a very uh, gripping kind of description of this lynch mob uh, hunting down uh, the Kuman leader uh, who takes refuge in the royal palace. But nonetheless, they uh, kill him and um, they uh, cut off his head and throw it out the window to the crowds below who are sort of clamoring for his death. Um, now, uh, Rogerius actually writes this um, account that doesn't just blame the Kumans. So it's quite interesting that he tries to give a balanced account and he blames to a large degree the, the nobles. Um, and say, says that they were unreasonable, that it, it was the king's duty to protect the Kumans. Um, and so it was unreasonable to uh, hold that against the king. But he also blames the Kumans not as immigrants, but as a kind of barbarian people who have very different customs. Um, the Kumans left Hungary after this uh, murder, but once the Mongol invasion was over, the Mongols withdrew from Hungary, um, the king actually invited the Kumans back um, and they ended up settling in Hungary and over time ended up merging into the local Hungarian population. So when we look at these different tales of migration, we can see that already in the medieval period, you have a sort of duality where early migration, so migration in the distant past, is valorized and actual migrants in one's own time are demonized and seen as dangerous and as enemies. But if you look at the long-term historical processes, I think it's uh, obvious that even these um, immigrant groups are, over time, actually integrated. The tale of the Hungarians' migration, however, started a new life, which still continues um, as part of Hungarian national identity. Thank you.